Um, so we got an hour here. We're going to just jump right into it. As you mentioned, uh, John and I put together a book with a lot of amazing writers. This gentleman on the far left here being a key part of this. And I'm on stage with uh, two bass players. I don't know if this ever happened before. How many letters in left? And you guys were on time. You guys both made the gig on time. <laughs> How many letters in port? <laughs> You're never going to forget. <laughs> But we're going to uh, start it off because uh, we did do a book. We, it comes out on the 29th, actually in hardback. We went really fancy, but this is our little advance. And we're going um, to start with a reading from the book of John. That's what they say. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> uh, so I'll just preface this by saying that um, Tom and my sweetheart harangued me for at least two years to write a book about punk rock, and I said no. That's bullshit. I am so <clears throat> uninterested in doing that because it sounds like discipline and work and everything else. And then in maybe a dream <clears throat> or as I was falling asleep one night, I thought, I know. I'll get other people to write it for me. <laughs> but <clears throat> I mean, that was kind of one of my thoughts, but also that um, the whole scene was very collaborative. And uh, <clears throat> we were talking, Lin Linda Ramone uh, did a panel on the, on the Ramones earlier and was saying how much everybody liked each other uh, back in New York. <clears throat> so the idea of having a lot of people write chapters for this and, and Tom and I kind of being narrators uh, really fit into the whole uh, feeling or the, <clears throat> the, the way that the LA scene was put together. So uh, I'll start with uh, one of my chapters. Chapter one, something's happening here. It could have been 10 p.m. in July in a painted hallway upstairs at the Whiskey A Go Go. There was a corner with red and black linoleum squares on the floor. This corner was at one end of another short hall and a staircase that led down to the stage. I stood there breathing short breaths, waiting for the rest of X to join me before we'd walk down those stairs. I imagined Jim Morrison and Raymond Zarek or Otis Redding or Arthur Lee or Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell standing on the very same spot waiting for the rest of the world to catch up to them. It wasn't the first time I'd been there, and this had become a kind of ritual. But it was the first time in 1978 that the show was sold out and the whiskey added another. This was a place where you knew that something was definitely happening, that you were definitely headed somewhere. I would look down at my shoes and those red and black squares and think that we were part of something, like others had been part of something else. Where the people in their audience <clears throat> had known something that other people did not, and were about to see something the rest of the world might see soon. When we walked down those stairs, I knew it would go from zero to 100 in a blink. Cymbals would crash, DJ Bonebreak would hit his drum so hard that he'd probably, break, probably knock something over, or snap a hi-hat pedal in two. I might pull the cord out of my guitar and stop the giant rumbling bass, and we'd forget about the asshole sound man that said we were too loud. After all those nights, <clears throat> we were too loud. After all those nights of rehearsal and learning songs, bad equipment at the mask and other DIY shows, this would be louder than hell. And there would be sounds hurtling past and swirling around us, and somewhere amidst that mayhem, there would be a moment where everything would slow down. And I would see things in slow-mo. I'd catch somebody's face distorted by a shoulder or the palm of another's hand, or Exine's hair would rise into a fan as she flipped her hair in and out of her face. I would glimpse her dark red lips making wonderful sounds that I knew were the only sounds that could be made at that moment. She would tell the truth to all these people who knew that she would tell the truth. So it goes on. <laughs> <clears throat> well, look, to start this off, and essentially what this book is, is the dawn of uh, not only punk rock, but LA punk rock, and LA punk rock being very specific to the West Coast and the sound that came out of it. And these two gentlemen, obviously, uh, were part of uh, two of arguably the, uh, how do I say this, two bands that were so much the sum of their parts. All the members of this band made up the sound of this band. And, and from these two bands came two uh, amazing legendary partnerships. And, and I'd like to kind of go through that since we're telling the history of, of how these partnerships came to be. How do you meet Dee Boone? It's a, it's a great story. Yeah. Uh, 
I found the word disclaimer. You gave a disclaimer when you talked about that trembling. Okay. You know, I fight Alzheimer. I don't let go. I, you know, like a chew toy with a dog. <laughs> I knew it was going to come to me. Okay, like D. Boone. I came to Pedro. Pedro's the harbor of Los Angeles. And I was in Virginia. My papa's a sailor in the Navy. Engine room guy. And Vietnam was a lot closer to Pedro. So in 68, I moved there. and I live in the Navy housing. He gets other orders to go to Alameda, kind of close to where he lives now, Richmond. And my ma says, fuck that. We've moved a buttload of time. No more. We're staying in Pedro. So we can't live in the Navy housing. I have to live, move to Praj. This Praj shares, it's a newer Praj, and it shares a park with an older one. And I was checking out this park. It's the biggest one in Pedro. It's called Peck Park. And this guy, I'm 12 years old, he jumps out of a tree on me. It was like, whoa. Uh, I we both go to the ground. And he goes, uh, he had big Coke bottle glasses, and he, uh, like I do now, but uh, anyway, he puts them on, and he says, you're not Eskimo. I said, no, because I guess he had a neighbor with a nickname, Eskimo. So this, I meet this guy. I said, I just moved here, and in fact, I'm over here. Let me show you. So we start walking over there, and he starts rattling off all these bits, you know, uh, uh, jokes, you know, uh, witty stuff, you know. And I'm thinking, this is the smartest dude in the world. Like, there's no gaps. I mean, it is just what would end up like a Minuteman gig. Just a little... <laughs> and so the next day, he wants to show me where he lives. He lives in the older one. This is Park Western. I, I lived in these new ones called the Park Western Estates. <laughs> yeah, fucking cracker box, you know. <laughs> Stucco and... But his were older, so they didn't qualify as estates. And uh, he plays me this recording, and it's this guy, George Carlin, and all those bits he had memorized. He didn't make any of it up. <laughs> but it was too late because I was smitten with him. I just thought he was just, even though, yeah, that was jive. And maybe not jive because uh, I learned some bass licks when I was trying to it's okay to copy a little bit, I guess. And after that, well, actually later that afternoon, his mom says, You're gonna, you guys are going to have a band. <laughs> you know, I never played, but he had been playing for about five, six months because she played as a girl. Now, this is, we're talking 1970. Yeah, 71, 70. So there's not a lot of guns yet in the heavier parts but there's fighting and stuff so she wants us in the house after school and that's the idea of the band we'll just play in the bedroom and uh, all bands have a bass so you're going to be the bass and I didn't know what a bass was I mean you know I saw in pictures on album covers it looked like a guitar with only four uh, we go to our first concert a couple years later it's T-Rex and there's no club scene so I'm not close enough. I don't really know who's doing what. Everybody's tiny, and the sound is. So I played a guitar for a couple of years with only four strings. I just thought they had skinnier necks. And I remember I was 16 when I saw my first bass. Just starting high school. In those days, that's when high school was. And the dude in the homeroom, I had been buffing badge and boasting. Yeah, I played bass with my buddy, you know. He sees me in this store just tripping on this you know, instrument. It's in Chuck's Sound of Music. In those days, the records were sold in the same place as instruments and sheet music. It, it was much different in those days. Anyway, this, I couldn't believe the strings. And I see this guy from school. I go, look at this thing. And the guy goes to me. He said, I thought you said you were a bass player and you play with your buddy all the time. And I said, I do. He goes, well, that's a bass. I said, I know that. <laughs> I did not know that. And I thought, oh, fuck, that's why there's only four strings, because they're so big. They're like bridge cable. And, not, and that's bass means bajo, you know? It's low. That's why it's called bass. It's lower. See, when I met D. Boone, the only rock band he knew was Creedence. 
his daddy was way into Buck Owens, and they'd lived a few years in Bakersfield before Pedro, and you know, he'd never heard Who or Cream or him, but he heard Creedence. And in fact, he had all six of those first records. And uh, of course, there are no, no uh, album covers. You know, they're in another place and all folded up. And the, so on a hardwood deck and the grape juice and the cheap <laughs> plastic record player, you need about seven quarters on it. Keep from, I can't hear what the bass dude's doing. I, 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 what's his name? Stu Cook. I can hear him now. He did some good lines. But in those days, I, could, I didn't know what he was. So I thought, I looked at the album covers. And I thought, well, I'll wear the singer's shirts, and maybe D. Boone will still like me. <laughs> so that's how I got into flannel. So a couple things happened to me at this time. I learned about George Carlin, met D. Boone, flannels, bass. See, probably the next big epoch was uh, the punk movement and getting introduced. But uh, this is what got me into music. I wasn't really a musician. I just wanted to be with my friend. It was. It was a different time. We didn't know that music was for expression. We thought it was something you did. Maybe younger people these days, it's, it's, that cycle's gone around. It's just something that's going on, you know? <laughs> Never thought of music as expression. Although I meet a lot of young people that use it as expression. We didn't. It was like building models. Well, it kind of looks like the real thing. Probably didn't, I mean, our ears, you know. But whatever, we had fun doing it together. Uh, when we saw the first gig, it blew our mind. Uh, not arena rock, a club gig, the bags, the whiskey on a Sunday. Uh, here's what happened. We were jamming with a friend of ours, like tie your mother down and dust in the wind and a bunch of crap like this. You know, no gigs, right? You just do this play, you know? You just, and we're taking a breather and we come out. It's this, uh, what now is Cabrillo Marina, but it was Lower Reservation Fort MacArthur. So they had all these old army things. They were renting out till they tore them down. So we're in one of those and we come out all sweaty. And there's a cat. Uh, his name was Jeff Visvich, but uh, I think you guys knew him as Nicky B. He was a Pedro guy that was in the weirdos. He's a drummer. And he had a Vaseline and he was wearing a Kotex around his neck. And he comes up to us and he says, you know, there's this scene in uh, Hollywood where people write their own songs. <laughs> I mean, I tell you, this is how lame the culture was. You know, I was like, what? <laughs> Whoa. Because, of course, the best dude in Pedro was the guy who could play Black Dog the best, you know, had nothing to do with <laughs> trying to use music as expression. So we go up there and we see this gig, you know, and uh, the first thing out of my mouth to D. Boom was, we can do this. <laughs> I mean, I didn't think twice. It just <laughs> fell out of my mouth. I said, we can do this. <laughs> you know, it blew my mind. Like, they just let anybody get up there and play. And, they, and, and it was wild. The freak flag was flying. You understand me and D. Boone were little boys in the 60s when people are taking things in their hands in the streets, anti-war and civil right and all kinds of stuff. And by the time we... We, we come of age in the 70s, yeah, you know, it's Nuremberg rallies at the big rock arena show. Is <laughs> Excuse my metaphor. I mean, we, you know, do you feel like I do? You know, no. <laughs> do all of us in this huge arena like the same person? No. Uh, do I get to even meet the dude in, sitting in the dark, you know, trying to see through all the motor smoke? And I don't know. It was just so... I'm glad for it in a way, because a farmer would tell you, if you want a good crop, use a lot of manure. And we had tons of it. <laughs> Bring it, motherfuckers. So this scene that he'd already been part get going was, man, that was the go. He gave us the geo. That's and good. later on, I mean, he, they got us in the rocks. But just him being part of that movement, it's hard to tell you what it was like. But they also let us bring something really personal, me and D. Boone together. Could join part of them, take turns playing for each other with them. Uh, Good segue. <laughs> Don't, you you had a job. very pivotal stop in New York on your way to LA from Baltimore, right? Uh, Musical. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I lived in Baltimore. Uh, 
played in bars for tips and played cover songs. And we would do a few original songs that sounded enough like the band or um, <clears throat> Neil Young or something like that, that people would say, oh, oh uh, yeah, it's not so bad. I, I like the other ones that I know better, but they're okay. they, they would pass. And um, but I got to 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 meet some. I would see John Waters and and the actors that he worked with, and and they were just hanging around in bars. And I thought, well, th this is kind of cool celebrity. This is celebrity like a mass murderer, or a, <laughs> or a, this is attainable. I could you know I could either be famous or infamous because uh, it was people like Mink Stoll and and David Lockery and. Uh, Divine didn't hang out that much, but John would. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I'd, I wanted to do something. It was clear that uh, that I wasn't going to do it in Baltimore, and that was kind of great because people just like Mike saying, people just did it for the hell of it because that was something to do because it was a way to express yourself and a way to just uh, <clears throat> not be bored and and just drink all the time. Although. <laughs> We tried. Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> so I was able to, my parents lived in New York, uh, and um, I, was, I had a free place to stay, so I could go up there and hang out and would see, uh, I saw Talking Heads and, and the Heartbreakers up at CB's and Max's Kansas City, and, and uh, I had David Bowie records and, and uh, <clears throat> Horses by Patti Smith, and I thought, well, it's, it's now or never. I was probably like 23. So uh, I said, fuck this. I'm not going to go to New York. I hate the East Coast. So uh, California is a place you got to be. Swimming pools, <laughs> movie stars. <laughs> Fancy eating table. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, went out to LA, and, and uh, I'd run a poetry reading in uh, Baltimore. Poetry at that point, like early mid-'70s, was really becoming a performance art thing. <clears throat> where people, the, the poetry was funny, it was entertaining, and people were talking about very personal things, a lot of, a lot of uh, stream of consciousness kind of stuff, and this n totally open verse, and, and so I'd run this reading series with a couple friends, and um, another kind of collective of people that didn't really fit into to things, so I, I liked that whole deal, and then um, <clears throat> I figured, well, I'm in a place that I have no friends, so who, where could I find like-minded people? And and found out there was this Venice Poetry Workshop. And I thought, excellent. And then somebody said, well, you know, uh, Tom Waits went there. And I thought, all right. And then Bukowski used to go there once in a while. Well, even better. So it's just down the street. So I go there Tuesday night, <clears throat> and uh, it's mostly people that you would, <laughs> people looked like poets. <laughs> and and that's not all good. But Exene, <clears throat> but Exene was there, and and here's this, you know, very uh, strange, mysterious, with uh, red hennaed uh, kind of wavy hair uh, and real dark lipstick. And I'm thinking, well, this looks interesting. So we were asked to fill out <clears throat> a, a piece of paper that, that said, uh, name your top 10 poets. And Exine didn't, she just liked writing. And she had a job at this place called Beyond Baroque, which is where the, the workshop was held. It was one of those um, CETA jobs where you could say, I'm, I'm poor and I don't know nothing, so give me a job <clears throat> and I won't you know, join a gang or something. So she was learning to be a typesetter from Beyond Baroque because they have a huge, small press library. So she went there Tuesday night for, for the first time, same with me, uh, who are your favorite poets? And she didn't know Jack. She just liked you know, writing and her sister wrote and she'd heard Patti Smith's record and a few other things and she was like, what, who do you have on your list? Because <laughs> I had studied some of that stuff, you know. It's like so. The very first thing that we did together was cheating. <laughs> and then she said, "Oh, by the way, you wrote the same name down twice, yeah. dumbass." <laughs> so I was like, "She's cheating," and also, uh, yeah, t taking me down a couple pegs, which still happens. And uh, you know, then we, the next time I think we went next door to this terrible jazz club called the Comeback Inn where they were playing <clears throat> like wave jazz before that was even a, 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 a genre. And uh, we were thinking like, this is terrible, but we're having a good time and we're buying each other drinks. And, and then, you know, it's like, like something fell out of the sky, like, like D. Boone. And, and it was, you know, looking back on it, I, I would say it's fate that, you know, we all got together at the same place and it was all happening there. And, and uh, yeah, 
the Minutemen were a great addition to that. You know, <clears throat> down the street from Come Back In was Radio Tokyo, where we did Double Nickels That's right. on the Dime. That's right. Can you believe yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, we did that. Because there uh, were three Washingtons. They finally named yeah. one of them Abbott Kennedy. Yes. We had this <laughs> three streets. It's all, not as bad as Peachtree in Atlanta, but right. <laughs> there's 14 of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, so you were saying the first gig you saw was a bags gig, when you bags. like, and that was when you kind of went. There's a scene happening. Well, I think, yeah, I would, I mean, before that, it was pictures in Cream Magazine. Guys looked like Aladdin Sane. Yeah. I didn't somehow. I didn't relate the Ramones to the pictures right. of the English guys, even though they were actually copying the. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they had. The Vivian information Westwood wasn't out like it was nowadays. <clears> you know, so we didn't. We thought the Ramones had their own world. It wasn't connected to anything. When did you guys realize? Then the label started sort of putting true. safety pins <laughs> That's sort on of them. True. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They, they still have actually their own all bands world. have their own worlds, huh? Yeah. But you know, when what? did when did either of you guys or both of you guys realize like there was something happening here? There's something real going on in LA. That oh, was I knew when I saw that gig. That was the gig. Yeah. In fact, yeah. D Boom would make a band. Yeah. You got to understand the negative. You know about this negativity towards punk scene. This was a minority movement. Most people hated it. And more than the Square Johns was the rock and rollers. They just hated it. That's why you're playing gay discos, ethnic halls. It's very hard. It, it was a lot of prejudice. People are so much more open-minded now these days. And cats who can play and stuff, they don't make fun of you. I put a picture of Richard Hell on my base. That was a line in the sand. Especially in Pedro, man. It was belligerent. We had to stop wearing our punk clothes. And we'll go back to high school clothes and just keep the punk in the head because people were just. Yeah, it was, it was very threatening. I mean, that's why some people will ask about, um, <clears throat> well, what do you think about punk rock today? And punk rock today is, has found a, a great, in, in my mind, I don't listen to like new punk rock bands maybe, but I know that it's a subculture and it's a niche and people can, they're 15 or 20, whenever they discover it and they go, wait a second. I can go to this place and I can do pretty much whatever I want. <laughs> and it costs $8 and there might be a drink smuggled in here. I'm in. And I get a black eye and get, go, get to go back to high school and say, dude, look at my fucking black eye. This foot came over. One. You know, and that's, I, I could care less whether, uh, you know, people say Green Day has has made it into the you know more homogenized. I mean, that's that's kind of dealt with in the book the way that you know things can sort of narrow down. But at least nowadays, I, I don't see the um, that same kind of belligerence. You know, this guy with the with brightly orange hair can walk in. Could be it's working green. at Starbucks. Could be could be you know <laughs> working in a fancy hotel, and that's you know like, jocks painting their fingernails. Yeah. You know, the I remember brought, when I first saw that. The hippies, the hippies brought us uh, wheat bread. <laughs> hippies made it so you could buy wheat bread in fucking Safeway. Right? And punk rockers mean that you could wear a mohawk and not get strung up, you know? That's about all we did. <laughs> but, but I would say that like, even though things may have narrowed down and maybe people think that punk rock now is, is more narrow mind, or a, like narrower definition, there's not the same kind of... Um, uh, like uh, uh, sexual and uh, there's there's a lot more diversity <clears throat> in punk rock now. I, I know that for a fact. There's not this like Nazi bullshit of of like uh, skinheads and and uh, you know beating people up. And you know that's also in the in the book. Jack Grisham talks about what it was like in Fullerton or wherever down in Orange awesome. County, where they were pursued. They would have like carloads of jocks chasing them down and beating the crap out of them. So they thought, okay, fine. How about if we get about 30 people and, you know, like send like one of the coyotes out there, send one guy out there and he starts getting beat up and Spade. then 29 L others come in. It was, uh, yeah, whatever. What? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> go through the thing that, that about LA punk rock as opposed to UK or New York, which were fantastic scenes was, uh, that it was such a melting pot of so much stuff. I mean, first time I saw the minute man, it confused the fuck out of me. You know, I mean, just the... the we thought the, that was the idea. Yeah, it was good. It was good. <laughs> you kept saying anarchy. You see, that was a problem. We took it at face value. No coercion. We didn't mm -hmm. mean it meant violence. We thought it was just thought, no coercion. That means you're not told what to do. 
Well, and you brought, as we were talking earlier, you, you both uh, had a big part in bringing the bass out of the closet. Yeah. So you go in the 60s, it was, it was, it was loud, and it was, it was up front, especially in the R&B stuff. And then the 70s, it took a serious backseat. Yeah. And you couldn't even hear it on the records. And yeah. then all of a sudden, I mean, that's one of the things that punk brought, brought us all to the awareness of the fucking bass, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you were writing songs on bass. Oh, yeah. Well, Dee Boone like, thought it was, he yeah. didn't think really politics was in words. He said it should be in the way the band's made. So I'm going to play trebly guitar like the R&B guys and give room for the bass and the drums. And we're going to make it egalitarian. And you're going to, you're going to bring this song. I ended up writing more songs. Not good, better ones. You know, <laughs> I'm going to be playing 30 of them later tonight that I wrote for Georgie and Dee Boone. But he wanted me involved because he says this is, you got to, uh, not just talk about it. You have to do You got to put it in action. It can't be just words. In words, I mean uh, not just spiel, but also lyric. And I, I know the men, men, they look at his lyric. Now, when they uh, asked D. Boone about his lyric, he said, oh, no, that's thinking out loud. It's not action. Action was uh, getting the bass high in the mix, having Georgie not just do backbeat, but lots of fills. I even have him talking. You know, me and D. Boone grew up playing together, so we didn't have to teach each other songs. So we spent most of the time getting Georgie in. The one thing we didn't do I hadn't hit upon yet is moving the drums to the front of the stage. You know, thing, I'm a slow learner. I like this idea with the drummer way up front. What a denial thing to call rhythm music and you hide the drummer and say he's retarded. Everybody knows the bass player's retarded. <laughs> That's what, you know, it's like right field in Little League. It's where you put... It's only four strings. Yeah. That's right. Unless, and if you play but, five or six, then it's like, no, I don't care. But that was the idea, it was to confuse it. Because that's what right. we got out of them. There was a liberation of watching these bands up there. Taking, sometimes they take stuff that was familiar, but they'd mix it in with some other wild thing. Like you're talking uh, this Bohemia poet things. Yeah, they didn't do this in arena rock so much. You know, I didn't learn about... Mr. Bukowski was living in my town the last 14 years of his life. You know, I finally got to meet him and stuff, but it was because of these guys. And then meeting cats that weren't in bands, gig-goers like Raymond Pettibone. Incredible effect on my life. He's the first guy to play me, John Coltrane. I thought he was a punk rocker that was older. I didn't know he was dead. I didn't know anything about <laughs> bebop. You know, I grew up in Navy housing. Raymond introduced me, and he started taking me gigs and see these older guys. And uh, I think you guys, too, got into, like, more uh, uh, roots music and stuff. It was, it's, punk was kind of a, a launching pad for us, the movement really to get deep in expression, I think. And then we, look, there was last shift. We're wearing this shift. We didn't worry about next shift yet. John jumped the gun with the Green Day thing. <laughs> but we, this scene was very interesting. It made us think about where does this come from? And the stuff from Europe, maybe like Dada, or stuff from Oklahoma, like Woody Guthrie. I mean, all this stuff was maybe out of New York. Uh, Walt Whitman, who put out his own book in 1855, talk about DIY. He writes 12 poems to try to stop the Civil War. I didn't know about any of this crap. They didn't teach me that in school. D. Boone was way into history, but he didn't even know. It's from this kind of wild art rock movement, which, on the other hand, we felt little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis that got lost from the arena rock. Well, T-Rex was good. We liked well, it. Yeah, and for, for a lot of us, it was coming to those gigs, too, that was opening our eyes to all this music we didn't we didn't hear and it was funny we were talking a week or two ago and you were talking about a gig uh at one point that there actually was an ex Minutemen jerry lee lewis gig yeah. universal was, amphitheater was and I, it was it was trippy i got to talk to jerry lee it was his 60th birthday i think could have been yeah and uh he had a lady with the big beehive hair and he uh he's got Two union guys on bass and drums, and he's like looking at their watches. Uh, Brian, uh, should I say his name? Yeah. Okay, Brian Sesser, he's <laughs> bu 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 busy in the mirror. <laughs> I mean, doing up there. And Jerry Lee's looking at the scene, and he says to me, uh, You know what? I, I was like, well, Yeah, what? <laughs> no. Chicken butt, no, no. He says, You know what? I like kids nowadays better than in the old days. And I said, why? He said, because kids these days are smart. When was that gig? 87, right? 86, 87. It was 83. 
No, no, because I'd be a Minuteman. I, it was. It was a Minuteman. Oh, it was. It was a Minuteman. Yeah. Shit. It was a Minuteman, Jerry, Jerry Lee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, the, the main point. <laughs> fuck. The main point. He said kids today are smart. He said kids in those days were stupid. This is what the killer told me, who shot a bass player, by the way. <laughs> and then, you know, I looked up. He had no bell. And I don't know why I was thinking this, but yeah, yeah, no, no you know, it's slim. I said, well, you... he said, yeah, well, I had stomach cancer. He cut it out. I just hope the foot was right in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's my Jerry Lee. But can you believe that's what he said, though? Huh. Yeah, that well, was a treat. And I didn't pull it out of him. He just brought it out. And then he came out there and he kicked the stool right away. He kicked the stool out into the crowd, was playing with the elbow and the ankle, uh, heel. It was wild. It was, you know, the, yeah. the chain, the lengths of the chains. Yeah. And I still feel with people today, uh, I, I don't think it was just a time pe uh, thing in a glass box. Yeah. I got to imagine that he was playing for your crowds, too. I can't imagine it was a lot of It was a lot of X. There. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, not a whole lot of crossover, but we didn't care. And, and we felt like, uh, <clears throat> like Mike saying, there was so much information exchanged about, hey, have you heard this? Have you heard the, you know, the Collins twins who were big rockabilly, uh, you know, have you heard Billy Lee Riley? And, and, and because all that stuff wasn't available, uh, you had to seek it out and get import records from, I mean, Little Richard records were out of print, yeah. and which is just insane. But regardless, because <clears throat> there was so much being inter exchanged and we thought, you know what, this is all the same. It went from like rock and rollers to uh, psychedelic bands. We won't talk about the arena acts, and then it's and then it's us, and it's all part of this. And then the beats were in there somewhere, and then the you know New York expressionist artists were in there somewhere, and you know Walt Whitman. Went, and it's it is this line of like this is cool shit, and then it, you know then going forward it went you know went down to Compton and and you know scooped up all those guys or it went to the indie bands in the Northeast and it's, you know, it, it is, there is a line to it. But um, I think our audience was, uh, <clears throat> I would like to think that then and now they're fairly open-minded. And if you're playing with your heart and you're, you know, it doesn't matter if you have some jazz faster than shit influences or your Jerry Lee or your, you know, <clears throat> Xane and John doing our version of what rock and roll is. It's like, oh, yeah, I like it. You can tap your foot, you know, whatever. So that that's yeah. What was it like? I mean, so much we want to talk about, and we're we're gonna we went open for questions too in about ten minutes. But um, when you guys first started to go on the road, when, what, at what point? It's sort of a broad question. At what point did you realize, oh shit, this is this is real. This is a movement. This is sustainable. Uh, there was a real thing happening that wasn't just a passing trend. It wasn't. It wasn't Casablanca Records. It was. It, this was going to. I think it was about around. 2010. <laughs> <laughs> we learned it from Black Flag. I mean, I, that circuit I pretty much still worked. That Dukowski with his phone book put together, and so, you know, it's ten of us in one boat in a van, yeah. and so we learned Econo, and yeah, never went in a hole. But you know, was it mountains and mountains of bones? But never when the Jamby Cano conquered people's pads. When you ain't playing, you're paying. A lot of it's vaudeville. A lot of it was from a hundred years ago, before there was radios and TVs and farmers. The only way they got any entertainment was dudes who worked the town. And actually, I'm proud to be part of that tradition in a way. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's shame in being a hoofer. I think you got to be pushing and be creative. Work in the towns is not drudgery. I remember reading interviews that in those arena rock days, and it was always guys in motels or hotels crying about what a lame life touring is. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I just did my 69th. Only 69 more. <laughs> Wait a so, minute. You have a, you, you have a count of how if many If you call tours? more than a month. But, but you've actually counted yeah. how many tours you've done? Yeah, if you call more than a month. Really? Yeah. This is, see... I'd so miss the boat on this. Well, that's okay. Well, Linda Ramon was diaries. Linda Ramon was saying that Johnny oh, he wrote did, down yeah. every gig, how many people were there, and how much they got paid. Every 
freaking gig that they played well, from the first one. Yeah, but this movement's full of weirdos. Yeah. You know, remember? <laughs> I know. Ian Mackay has written back every kid who's written him. Holy what about Holy. that? <laughs> Holy Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, I, I don't know what... what I didn't what mean weirdo in a bad way. <clears throat> no, no. I, I, I would say, uh, I, don't, I don't think we did know that it was really something. And uh, maybe, maybe when, the, when we were playing two shows a night at the Whiskey, we felt like it was something. Right. You know, but <clears throat> it, it's still the same kind of thing. You'll play in New York, and you'll play two nights in a place that holds three to five hundred people. If you're doing good, you know that that time around, and then you'll go, you know, a little further west, and you'll play for seventy-five people, and you'll think, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's all going to go up the chute. You know, so. <laughs> So uh, yeah. hills and valleys, hills and valleys. Yeah. So it's it's like, I mean, and I, I would say that anybody who's not a, a giant act would would tell the same story, or you, you don't know, and it doesn't matter. At, at some point, it really doesn't matter, <clears throat> as long as you can, you know, be in the black when you get home, pay the people that you're working with, and and everybody, you know, it, it, you're not in it for the money. Was there? What was the? Well, that's the uh, Jamie Cano philosophy. Right. That's where we got it. Actually, it's from the Cano line van name. Right. They stopped making them. August 2014. Now they got this thing called the Transit. It's a uh, Euro oh, style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no Valiant. Over. No Take the L out of Lover, and it's over. <laughs> 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 Motel. <laughs> little wave. Little wave there for you. I mean, one thing that comes across in the book, too, and it was it, that there was this real camaraderie. There was regionalism. There was, everyone was really supporting each other. Fanzines. Got to remember yeah. that. And it was... And, it shows you're all, and it's funny, one of the bands, kind of a side track, one of the bands that comes up consistently in the book is the Screamers. Oh, Everyone yeah. talks about the Screamers. And no, no Who, guitar. No guitar. Two keyboards? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and the drummer plays alongside a drum machine. <laughs> and, and never actually made a real record, right? Because they thought it was over. Right. There's some demos, though. Right. They yeah, didn't come to that decision list. right away. They're actually a Seattle band called Tupperwares that come down with a duche. <laughs> Yeah, the guy in the mentors. Right. They finally decided they weren't manly enough. <laughs> he was, he was, there was a lot of characters in that scene. Mm. I tell you, there was, in England, I heard this expression that, uh, who's that DJ? Mark Riley said, yeah, a one-off. He called Taff Falco a one-off. But I, maybe a one-off ain't a bad thing. Maybe if you look at your thumb, I think we're all one-offs. <laughs> <laughs> it's this other herd side of the brain that's trying to say, no, you're not. Yeah, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> that's the dangling duality. <laughs> <laughs> what were the, um, like the, the, the cracks in the scene, I guess, when it started? I mean, when the hardcore thing, when you started to have the jocks come in and there's uh, Teresa from a, a great uh, band, uh, from the east side called The Brat talks about um, yeah. when the hardcore kids went to a Black Flag ki gig and basically tore up the club out there. And, and she sort of s cited that as like uh, sort of the beginning of the end of the L.A. scene as it was. I mean, was that, was the, because you guys played real nice together, literally and figuratively. Yeah, but, but these at what are younger the people. There are a lot of testosterone. Right. Uh, it got kind of male-dominated. Much different. The Hollywood scene had a lot of ladies in the bands. Right. It was much different dynamic. There wasn't a lot of kids. There was people from glitter and glam. It wasn't people still going to high school like Jack and having to deal with jocks. <clears throat> well, there, Jock, there, yeah, there, there were. I mean, there were like teenage runaways that would. Uh, Some of them, Donnie, you know, and Donnie, Donnie and, Rose. and uh, Gary Ryan, and people that ended up doing good stuff. Well, some, but uh, I, I think it was more. Yeah, it, it was more eclectic, artistic, um, with a, 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 nobody taking themselves seriously. So it wasn't art with a big, with a capital A. So it's unfortunate that that did mark the end of it, but I think it, the, the more people that come into anything, the more possibility you have of, of, of uh, misunderstanding and people trying to prove themselves and, and that kind of thing. You know, like in any in any situation, it's like Little Richard, Tutti Fruity, Pat Boone sold many more copies, and oh, that's yeah. years ahead. Yeah. Right. Things get co-opted. Yeah. Also, youth, you know, it's a weird time. 
a lot of peer pressure, I can imagine, on those cats. So the music, they didn't want to like, if we're part of the tribe, we all play the same song. It's funny about hardcore, man. You can have an Indonesia hardcore band. You can have, you know, a Mali one. They all sound the same. Yeah. It's the great equalizer. And I can understand that on some level. But if you've got kind of curious minds, it, it gets a little tired. If you're in the, not saying anybody's above anybody, but some people, they're a little restless. They got to experiment. And the Screamers was like a total experiment band. They had no trappings of the old... I shouldn't say trappings, but they, the, was, the only thing they had from uh, rock and roll, like Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis days, was just shock. They didn't use any of the old, well, they yeah. did use piano. You know, rock and roll is piano music. Now I think about it. It wasn't guitar music. No, it's rock and roll. The roll is down here and the rock's up here. Okay, and that's yeah. a bass. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> should we, should just we, we open up to some questions? Anybody we have so. mic set up? Anyone? Don't be intimidated. What what could happen? How did uh, how did you know Truth and Poetry with X? When did you how did you introduce to a scene to feel like you become part of a community? Like what was the moment like it like with Crooky at the Mask? It's like that was that the introduction was. You know I I, I wish I remembered, <clears throat> um, but I th I think it was uh, just. Word of mouth, uh, maybe somebody put a flyer up uh, about um, uh, a show at The Mask and there was 15 or 20 people there. Uh, I remember hearing that there was a rehearsal place. Um, there was some other more pop uh, bands called the, well the Motels were part of it. And uh, also a band called The Pop and a band called The Dogs. And, <clears throat> and they were beginning to rent out uh, union halls uh, and, and so, the seeds of the punk rock DIY were already happening when I moved there in '76. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, you know, from Woody Guthrie uh, through Bob Dylan, uh, you know, poetry was always part of it. And and uh, but we, I mean, we pushed it a little further, like towards the Doors, Jim Morrison, you know, economic uh, scenes being painted. But um, <clears throat> you know, we always loved the, the Ramones because it was just straight up and it was kind of dumb, but it was beautifully economical, you know? And uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, what year did you both first go to the UK and how did the scenes in the UK and the US sort of like compare and contrast? Uh, I think we went there in 1981, maybe? and played probably three shows. One was at Dingwalls, and I don't remember what the other one was. Just bars, you know, pubs and bars that, that had. Uh, but you know, everyone thought that since you were from California, we had nothing to gripe about. And, and uh, you know, all were given a Mercedes and a, and a swimming pool when we moved there. And, <laughs> and, and, but it was great to be able to, you know, have made that. Uh, that was one of the reasons that we titled our record Los Angeles, because we wanted to let them know that it was like uh, our skid row was as bad as their skid row and, and that bohemians live on, you know, 200 bucks a month just like you guys or whatever, you know. So we felt, we felt pretty proud to, to bring, you know, we were talking about Raymond Chandler and Charles Bukowski and film noir and, and, and all the, you know, more underbelly kind of elements of L.A., not Farrah Fawcett and... The Eagles, and which is all kind of made-up stuff. What bands were you playing with when you first came in? I really don't remember. It was uh, February '83 when Minutemen first went, and it was with Black Flag, and it was Hundred Club, yeah. and Brixton Ace. Uh, the Hundred Club people security was something called NF. First time I met them, interesting. Wanky. Yeah, well, we got <laughs> one of the guys running for uh, chief garbage collector, doing the same thing. Thirty something years later. And it, there, there was a lot of belligerence. There was a wave of uh, what, the exploited, this kind of thing. And uh, so, so no open, no tolerance. And uh, not just England, on the continent too. In Vienna, first note of first song, the power goes out, it comes back on, I'm covered with used condoms. T. Boone's got a whole cup of piss thrown in his face. And Munich, we had uh, bags of shit, paper ones, so they rip when they hit you, uh, puke and turd, and you know. 
Well, compared to batteries and full beers, yeah, because <laughs> they I'll don't take, hurt I'll it. take a full beer over a bag of shit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. It hurts. I don't know if you're going to lose teeth. <laughs> yeah. You take a nine-volt battery in the I head. Know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, there was some belligerence, but I don't blame any of the people over there. I thought they just was caught up in a tran. <clears throat> We had violence here, yeah. 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 Well, you know, the, uh, he's, he's, he's talking about the Ramones, so I don't know if anybody else can hear, uh, that the Ramones didn't want to go to England because they get covered in spit. And, and there was a little bit of that in the early Hollywood scene. And, oh, yeah. And we just said, oh, no. We would just stop playing and say, listen, motherfucker, you got a problem, come up and see me. <laughs> Which occasionally people would do. <laughs> but... Don't don't do that. And and we also you know, like when when there was violence uh, in in the in the audience and, and it wasn't uh, consensual kind of stuff, <laughs> just people like running around and falling down and stuff like that. We would stop. We would stop. There was a there was one of those uh, psychopaths that was in the decline of Western civilization. The guy that had the X shape in his head. His yeah. name was Mike X <clears throat> Yeah, he was an ex. <laughs> he was a he was a he was an ex marine. He was a yeah. psychopath, no doubt about it. And there was a couple times that he would take one of those big chains that you'd chain a dog up in a yard, yeah. and he was swinging around his head like a 10-foot length of chain. And it was just like, oh, no, no, no. That guy, out. You know. uh, remember Fear? They had a bass man named Durf. I bought my first Fender from him. He was selling real estate in Santa Monica, and his parents, you know, trip, we had a thing called the Recycler, you know? Yeah, yeah I didn't know, you know? So anyway, he's doing this gig. We uh, start his ballroom. And he, he, he can spit back. And he has an eagle eye. I mean, he could nail dudes. And, he, and, he, and this is when it moved from Hollywood to, I mean, it's, the gig was up in Hollywood, but the audience was definitely OC. Mm -hmm. And this big athletic man grabbed him by the hair. And remember, he had a, tape, a cup tape to his head to drain, because he had a crack in his skull. There was some extreme violence uh, uh, that was crazy. Yeah. Uh, the Europeans, we didn't have uh, people fighting as much. I, it was a weird tour on the dynamic because that was the second time for Black, Black Flag. And the first couple of tours, Hank had to fight every gig. Greg said, you're not going to fight anymore. So the tour we did with them, no more punching. They're putting cigarettes out in Hank's back and shit. Yeah. So that was kind of weird. But that happened in Chicago on St. Patrick's Day, in fact, 1983. 34, uh, 33 years ago. Mr. Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's it's an uncomfortable place to be to to be the vice principal, you know. Um, but yeah, we we stopped playing that song because I, I w when it was a uh, more testosterone driven crowd, you know. Then they I I didn't think they really understood that it was an anti rape song, and then it was, you know. But the lyrics were getting into the brain of a of you know some truly misfit. You know, sociopath kind of person. Uh, you know, Exine wrote the the line Johnny Hit and Run Pauline, and then I made up the story. Um, <clears throat> so I think you have to be something of a leader. You have to say like, well, maybe that's not a good idea. And then if people don't stop, then you have to just remove yourself or actually get in there and, and do it. But um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of shock value. You know, in uh, and and I I still appreciate that and I still like that. It's it's harder to to find that nowadays, maybe. But um, you know, in in the song Los Angeles, she has started hate every nigger and Jew. I mean, we said that to call attention to that whole idea, to say those words, not to mince them, and to say this shit happens. So what do you think? Discuss. 
you know, that, that kind of a thing. So, so the people were, were jarred, and, and, and then journalists would say, well, well you said this one. And then you could say, what do you think? This is what I think, that when people are pushed to a, to a certain place, they start lashing out, you know, at, at, I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy either, because I'm threatened, you know, just like what's happening now in the election, or the elections now. Yeah. <clears throat> Carrie. First Minuteman one was uh, Continental Club. Mark Pratt, Terry Pearson were running. I think Keith Ferguson was on base uh, for the Tailgaters. Kind of roots band. Guy had a metal vest on, played keys. <laughs> and the guitar man was, yeah, he loved the little songs. He kept saying, yeah, I do something like that. But I keep on it. You guys just you go to the next one. I heard it's still around. The Cottonelle Club still around? Oh, yeah, still, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember exactly where we played. I do remember playing with the big boys and, uh, and the dicks and, and really red. And, and it, of course, we came here and it's like there was a phrase, keep Austin weird. You didn't even have to have that phrase because there was, that was there. It came later. Um, and, and it was, uh, we immediately bonded with them. It was like, because it's similar, you know? It's similar Southern California, and here it's like, it's nice weather, you have good Mexican food, people <laughs> like to, you know, hang out and drink beer and smoke weed, and it's like, yeah, I like this, you know, so. Two more Who's going first? You go. Okay, great. Hey. Um, this is a comment for John and Mike. I just want to yeah. Hold on one second. Thanks. All right. Uh, this is a comment for John and Mike. Um, first, uh, I did see X in 2013 at Riot Fest in Chicago, and just want to say thanks for the concert. It was great. And uh, Flag was playing too on the same stage as Blink 182, and we uh, all the Black Flag fans pretty much beat up all the Blink 182 fans waiting for them. <laughs> so I think this is kind of something you would find amusing because I really found that amusing. Really? Um, also, uh, I, yeah, I was not a Blink-182 fan, if you get the idea. Uh, Mike, uh, yeah. I have this um, concert DVD of the Stooges from, I think, what they, you got them back together in like 2003, 2006? But well, they did. I helped yeah. them out. Right. I just want to say thanks for... I was finally the youngest guy in the band. <laughs> I just want to say thanks for making that happen. It's uh, oh. one of my favorite concert well, DVDs, you... and I still watch it about once a month. Yeah. So just want to say thank you. You're very kind. But that was a mind blow, 125 months. Without Stooges, it was a big part of our movement. They were kind of the lingua franca. You know, SoCal is really spread out, maybe 150 towns. It looks like one if you fly over it, but it ain't. One thing in common, Stooges. Everyone knew Stooges. And to get a call from Ig, yeah. Ronnie says, you're the man. I fucking couldn't believe it. I was in Tallahassee with my second man place called the cow house I think it was the second one he said Mike will you do me a favor and wear a t-shirt just have a flannel I said fuck yeah I said John Fogarty's idea anyway <laughs> or dress for Perry he said I said what about Levi and Converse he said that's strong <laughs> said, then we talked about he telling me about he had nightmares about the drummer in lime green nothing against your hair I love it <laughs> bass player in bright orange and how he, he was going to make sure all, everything looked good. I think a front man who don't operate in a machine, he's kind of a bridge to the people. It's a different thing than a machine operator, you know. And finally he gets to the music. He goes, now look, however we end the songs, that's how we end them. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, I thought it was like, what do they call in Zen? The cone? But then I, fi I figured it out. The first down, a lot of the songs fade out. That's what he was talking about. Ig, you know, I'll say something about Midwest people. They're very, not a lot of front. They say what they mean. And the Stooges guys are a lot like that. Ig's a lot like that. And then I left my guys in Memphis and went out there and I thought it was going to be the only gig. And it kept going and uh, I, I can't believe it. It helped me be a better bass player, big time. This really feels like a talk show from this view, you guys. Yeah, I'm over here. Uh, we have a question here in the audience. Hello. 
Um, so, uh, and I see the, the shakes and shivers are coming. Um, uh, just, I don't know, microphones just used to see. Anyway, um, so when I, I can understand like um, not wanting to write the book or a book in general is because you have to kind of reconcile the past. And punk rock can be kind of a, like a, a, a catch-all for a lot of different types of people because you got, I mean, like you, w when you're in the scene, you know, you just you meet a lot of different people. So is it hard for there not to be this veil of nostalgia that sort of like gives you these rose-colored glasses about some of, some of the stuff that's might have or the people you met and like, you know, shaking out to the top uh, ra rather than like falling out, like it can make you, I don't know, it can give you kind of like this, I don't know, deepness in your gut knowing that you, you didn't fall but you can like, you know, cast your vision to the past and give, give this like romantic view of what might have happened. Uh, yeah, I, there, there might be a little revisionist uh, views, uh, a little more romantic than it, than it was at the time. Um, that's inevitable, but I think we, <clears throat> I think everybody was honest enough. And, and that was also, uh, I realized after we got into it, is that would be a benefit of it, then it wouldn't just be my perspective, it would be all these different perspectives. There's a lot of crossover, like we're talking about certain bands. And <clears throat> um, people were pretty honest. And, and I, uh, you know, it, it what, I'm surprised that it's not more lurid than it is. It's not really a, you know, a sensationalized kind of book. It's more just like these are the, 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 the better parts of our, of, of our um, artistic, like, there's some luridness in there. A little bit. I'm just saying it, it could be. It could be more. You know, I, I I hear the replacements book is just all like, piss and shit and drinking beer and stuff, but, um, which there was a lot of. But <clears throat> anyway, so does that answer your question? It it, it is a little romanticized, but but not. Um, I think people are st very still proud that they were there. I mean, as long as you feel good about it. Yeah, it's 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 the real story, and there's a, there's also an audio book that got done. Uh, Penguin Random House, what? <laughs> Said, okay, we'll do and, and we'll do an audio book, and we got all the authors to read their chapters, which is you know pretty f freaking great. I mean, within 15 or 20 years, this isn't you know Paris in the 1920s, but at the same time, it's kind of great that we had you know everybody's still alive and they just read their thing, and you can hear them saying their own words. It's it's kind of awesome. People get choked up sometimes. It was bitching for him to have me aboard, <laughs> truly. <laughs> no, they helped us 35 years ago. And I don't know. It's Thank you. Aww. Grazie. Aww. <laughs> um, well, I think that's all the time we have. I think so. <laughs> uh, any words, Mike, would you like to impart some words of uh, advice to the audience? Yeah. You have great words of advice. Jeremy Cano. <laughs> and, and Mike and I are playing over at uh, the main two tonight. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, he's on at eight, I'm on at nine or something like that. Um, it's what Emo's used to be. It's right. Red River and Sixth or something like that. So rock and roll bands still happening. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, South by Southwest. Thank you.